Ministers Strategic Affairs. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center. My name is Jeff DeBelko. I'm very fortunate to direct our Environmental Change and Security Program, sponsored for today's event. A uh, discussion of, uh, I think you will uh, agree with me now, or at least after you hear his presentation, a very important book uh, that Eric Shivian has written entitled Sustaining Life, How Human Health Depends on Biodiversity. I should say he's also done that with Aaron Bernstein, of course. Um, it's, uh, it's a thrill for us to have this discussion, one that fits very directly into uh, a broad theme of topics that we have engaged with at the Woodrow Wilson Center for over a decade now that we kind of uh, talk about health and environment or uh, population health environment development, but this kind of integration of some of these worlds, some of these communities, disciplines, research bases, um, and in policy interventions on the ground that don't always come together. And I think part of what we learn from books like this and some of the discussions we've had in this room is that it's really impossible to tease these things apart and pretend that we can stay in our disciplinary silos. So it's <coughs> very welcome that this book has been written, that these issues have been brought together because as we will see, they're intimately uh, intertwined in ways that are um, very difficult to understand at times, uh, but are critical and incumbent upon us to do so. Uh, here at the Wilson Center, uh, just a word about where you're sitting. We're the formal memorial to Woodrow Wilson. So as our only president who had a PhD, Congress, when it set us up in 1968, thought it appropriate to have a living memorial where the worlds of scholarship and policy could come together, uh, learn from one another, and hope, uh, hopefully improve endeavors in, in both areas. So we do that on a nonpartisan, non-advocacy basis and have since 1968. Our, um, specific program, the Environmental Change and Security Program, is a younger one. We were founded in 1994, and uh, through meetings like this, through publications that hopefully you will avail yourself of from the table outside and online, uh, we try to facilitate this kind of dialogue, including also, I should mention up front that uh, today's event is being webcast live, and then the video will be archived online so that you can share and we can share um, the insights from today beyond this room, but with folks um, all over the world. Um, Let's turn to our speakers. Um, I mentioned Eric Shivian is the uh, co-author of this book. He's the founder and director of the Center for Health and Global Environment, as well as assistant clinical professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Um, he really is um, uh, fair to say that he's a go-to person on this issue, if not the go-to person on this issue. So it's tremendous that we've had him joining us. Uh, Michael Wright, who's going to provide some uh, additional comment as a, as a discussant, is the Managing Director of the Natural Capital Project. It's a joint venture among the Woods Institute for Environment at Stanford University, Nature Conservancy, and World Wildlife Fund. So obviously three heavyweights uh, coming together, um, as I think many of you know. Michael was also at the MacArthur Foundation, director of the Conservation Sustainable Development Program. So has seen some of these issues from um, a multiple different chairs, shall we say. So it's terrific to have his insights here today. And then on my immediate left is Tom Lovejoy for um, somebody who on these issues will be very familiar, but also if you are come to the Wilson Center who will be very familiar. Tom is, is one of our best recidivists in terms of coming and participating up front and in the audience. Uh, Tom has been there with our program from the very beginning in 1994, was an advisor to my predecessor and has very gracefully continued uh, to work with me and with PJ Simmons uh, in helping guide the program. And so it's a real thrill that Tom uh, who's the biodiversity chair at the Heinz Center here in town uh, and really one of the world's foremost experts on biodiversity um, and in, in fact it's a big part of coining the term biodiversity uh, is here with us to really kind of open up and be a scene setter for for the discussion so I think Tom I'll turn the floor over to you and then we'll turn it to Eric great well thank you for the opportunity to be with you all this afternoon uh, and spent some time sort of contemplating our connections with the natural world, uh, which most people sort of float along through life blissfully unaware of. And even those of us who spend a lot of time thinking about those connections always have a lot more to learn. And there's no better evidence for that than uh, what Eric has been able to uh, pull between the two covers of sustaining life. Uh, it's a remarkable achievement. 
Uh, it is so substantial that I have to confess that I have yet to find the time to read it through from beginning to end, which I need to do to do the book review for bioscience. <laughs> but that's, uh, it's really a compliment uh, to what Eric's been able to achieve. So uh, let me just throw out just a, a couple ways of thinking about our interactions uh, with the living planet, uh, just to sort of stir the pot a little bit, and then we'll have the, the real delight of getting to the main course here, which is Eric. Uh, and then I guess Mike gets to be dessert. <laughs> uh, so when I first got interested in the natural world when I was about 14, I had the great advantage of a biology teacher who basically took me through the plant and animal kingdom, including fungi, uh, as well as all the principles of biology. And one of the odd groups of organisms uh, that I learned about at that time were a group called slime molds. Now, you might wonder what slime molds have to do with anything. And uh, I mean, they're very curious. Sometimes they ooze around like amoebae, and then other times they throw up fruiting bodies like fungus. Uh, same species will do that. Uh, and that's about all I ever knew about slime molds until a few years ago, uh, when in the inevitable way that scientists get curious about something, uh, somebody began to look into the, the biochemistry of slime molds and found a whole group of compounds that they use to repel uh, natural enemies uh, in the environment. And it started by discovering one in a slime mold on the banks of the Zambezi River. Uh, hardly one might expect to have much to do with anybody's daily life. Uh, but it turns out, in fact, that this uh, group of compounds uh, is very effective in uh, treating cancers which are resistant to taxol. Uh, so I just offer that as an example of this constant stream of discovery of facts about living systems and the building of life sciences uh, from plants or animals or microorganisms that everybody thought was uh, uh, just a curiosity uh, until a discovery is made. Uh, so that is, in fact, one of the most important reasons to have Take, have and take care of biodiversity, it's this living library function. All the way at the other end of the scale, uh, taking us beyond what it does for us in terms of food and shelter and many, many other things, uh, is the whole issue of ecosystem services, uh, which Mike is spending so much time on these days. Uh, and they range all the way from something like a watershed, a small watershed, or the New York City watershed, or in fact, the way the whole biosphere atmospheric interaction takes place. Uh, and there are two times in the history of life on Earth uh, when carbon dioxide was at extremely high concentrations. Uh, and was removed by the atmosphere uh, by the combined work of green plants and uh, their uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Quite extraordinary power built into all of that. Uh, and we, in fact, are in a position to take advantage of that to some degree uh, by actually thinking about planetary engineering using ecosystems and restoring them as much as possible uh, to take a significant amount of carbon that we've thrown up in the atmosphere back out. It doesn't get us off the energy imperative, uh, but it does limit the peak amount of climate change and how long some of that CO2 will stay in the atmosphere. So that just sort of gives you the span of how we are basically 
dependent uh, on the biological systems and biodiversity of the planet. Um, and Eric has just done an extraordinary job of compiling and making intelligible a great deal of that kind of thing, and I'm happy to turn it over to him. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Tom, for that wonderful introduction. I, I sometimes feel that uh, I wish my parents were around to hear some of these introductions because my father would have been very proud to hear that, and my mother would have believed every word of it. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, be speaking here, um, and it's a special, especially ple pleasurable uh, the week before Barack Obama is being inaugurated as president to uh, be at the institution that honors Woodrow Wilson, who, to my knowledge, was before Obama the last uh, university professor uh, who uh, became president. Um, and, of course, Wilson's tireless uh, efforts to uh, foster international cooperation through the League of Nations uh, would be deeply resonant with uh, our president-elect. Uh, but I must say it's a little daunting to be speaking about biodiversity with uh, Tom Lovejoy on my right and Michael Wright on my left. Uh, it's a little like talking about how to paint uh, with Vermeer sitting on my left and Degas sitting on my right. So you have to forgive me a little bit if I'm uh, slightly nervous about this uh, opportunity. Well, my parents uh, told me many things about uh, being a person of good character, but, but two that have always stayed with me uh, were they said to me, never ask other people for money and never blow your own horn. And clearly, I have not listened to them because in my <laughs> job as director of the Center for Health and the Global Environment at Harvard Medical School, I ask people for money every day. And this afternoon, you will see that I am not listening to their uh, second uh, comment about uh, being a person of good character. So you must forgive my, my blatant and truly shameless act of self-promotion as I tell you about sustaining life, how human health depends on biodiversity. But I and the more than 100 uh, other scientists who have put this book together are enormously proud of it. And I can honestly say that I've never worked harder on anything in my entire life. So in the 1980s, and actually in 1980, uh, with three other Harvard faculty members later to be joined by uh, three leading Soviet physicians. Um, I helped start an organization called the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. This is a group that uh, won the 1985 uh, Nobel Peace Prize. And the most important contribution of the tens of thousands of physicians who were eventually part of this federation, in my view, was to help people grasp what a nuclear war would really be like by talking about the human health impacts, so that they knew that these weapons were so catastrophically destructive that they could not be used in wartime, and so that they would do everything in their power uh, to prevent a nuclear war from occurring. And we did this by translating the very abstract and technical science, the physics of nuclear weapons explosions, into the concrete personal terms of human health. And I think by doing that really helped uh, felicit uh, facilitate uh, uh, an understanding by the public and by policymakers about nuclear weapons and nuclear war. But with changes to the global environment like climate change and the loss of biological diversity, the level of complexity and abstraction is really an order of magnitude, or many times more than that, greater than it is about nuclear weapons. And the changes occur slowly on, on global scales. They're often hard to see over natural fluctuations like changes in temperature, which happen all the time, or what species are present in an ecosystem and which ones are not. And particularly for those of us who live in urban settings in wealthy industrialized countries. And, and therefore, it, it, it's even more essential for physicians and public health professionals to describe and discuss 
these global environmental changes in human health terms. We have no Hiroshima's or Nagasaki's uh, to serve as models. And, and the task is made much, much more difficult, as I'm sure all of you have thought a lot about, because there's such a fundamental misunderstanding that most people have about the environment, and that is that human beings are separate from it, that it exists outside of us, and that therefore we can degrade oceans and forests and wetlands and soils and lose countless species in the process as if these changes would have no effect on us whatsoever, as if we were insulated uh, from them, almost as if they were happening somewhere other than where we live. And in, this, in my view, is really at the heart of the global environmental crisis, and it's the reason uh, we wrote this book. So I want to start by <clears throat> sort of walking through uh, the book. This is the, the book's cover. I wish I could do both at the same time. I actually have two laser pointers, but I don't think I could pull it off. So I'm going to be using this screen. You have to forgive me. So this is the cover of the book, and this is Art Wolf's uh, spectacular photo of a blue dark poison frog. Its Latin name is Dendrobates tinctorius. It comes from Suriname and other parts of South America. And we chose this photo, and really amphibians be, have become the poster child for this book because they're among the most endangered groups of organisms on the planet, with some one-third of known species at risk of extinction. But we chose it also because they're enormously valuable amphibians to human medicine. The toxins, for example, the alkaloids in the skin of this frog are very important in helping us understand the action of local anesthetics like Novocaine. And if you look very carefully, uh, you notice, well, not so carefully, you notice we chose this image because the frog seems to be admiring our title. <laughs> and if you look very carefully, and at the mouth, you'll see that it may even be smiling a little bit because it notices that Edward O. Wilson, who studies the world's great ant biologist, who studies Tinctorius's favorite food, has written the foreword for this book. <laughs> so this is the jacket, more exquisite design from Oxford, Al Gore. Uh, said very kindly that sustaining life was the most complete and powerful argument I have seen for the importance of protecting biodiversity. I told you I was shameless. <laughs> so it was a challenge to decide how to organize the material for this ambitious project. We, we wanted the book to stand on its own as a reference uh, for scholars in ecology and medicine and therefore had to review the literature. There's some 70 pages, 1,400 references of a, a peer-reviewed literature. We wanted it also to be a textbook uh, for colleges and universities and medical schools and vet schools. But most of all, we wanted it to be a resource for people concerned about the natural world who may not have a technical scientific background, so that the book had to be written in non-technical language. And as you can imagine, getting 100 scientists to write material in non-technical language is no small task. So I'm going to go through the uh, chapters very quickly and then talk about some of the case studies to illustrate the points that we're trying to make. So this is uh, chapter one, uh, what is biodiversity? One always has to show an image of beetles when asking this question because there's some 350,000 known beetle species, more than six times the number of all vertebrates combined. Um, and gen when J.B.S. Haldane was asked what he could conclude about the creator by studying his creation for his entire lifetime, was reported to have said, quote, he had an inordinate fondness for beetles, end of quote. So each of the chapters has a full uh, page uh, color plate, and there's some 30 in the book. Chapter two, how is biodiversity threatened by human activity? This is a rather hard image to see, but it's the uh, uh, New Orleans, uh, Mississippi Delta, um, and a satellite image, and it's showing the beginning of, of the formation of uh, dead zones with algal uh, blooms because the Mississippi is carrying uh, nutrients from uh, sewage and from farms. Uh, into the Gulf and re resulting in these algal overbloom. 
So it illustrates sometimes these uh, cascades of events that lead to loss of biodiversity are enormously complex. Chapter three on ecosystem services. Uh, this is a very moving uh, image to me. These are women from the Maotian County at the border of China and Nepal. They are hand pollinating apple blossoms because the bees in this region have gone extinct from an overuse of uh, pesticides. It's the front plate of this chapter on ecosystem services. Um, it takes 100 uh, people uh, I'm sorry, it takes 25 people to pollinate 100 apple trees, a job that's done uh, very easily and much, much more efficiently by two beehives. And I keep bees, and as you may know, there are problems with uh, bee colony collapse disorder in this country, and it's a complicated story that um, we uh, cover some in the book. Chapter four, medicines from nature. These are uh, cone snail shells. I'm going to talk about them in a moment. This chapter covers uh, medicines from plants and animals and microbes on land and in the oceans. Chapter five on biomedical research and biodiversity. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the uh, Drosophila melanogaster, the common fruit fly without this organism and its uh, contributions to understanding uh, human and uh, all, all genetics, uh, we would not be able to uh, have sequenced uh, the genome of any organism. The basic information from this organism has led uh, to that. Chapter six uh, is on uh, seven, this is the heart of the book, looks at seven groups of organisms, uh, bears, amphibians, sharks, non-human primates, cone snails, gymnosperms, which are conifers and ginkgo and cycads, et cetera, and horseshoe crabs looking at how they, each of these groups is threatened, uh, species in these groups are threatened, and how they've contributed to human medicine. And of course, the implication is how they could continue to contribute. Chapter seven on infectious diseases. This is a um, hand-drawn uh, image from a, a British Museum 1901 folio showing Anopheles species. Uh, oh, this particular uh, number 15 is Anopheles gambii, the, principal malaria vector in Africa. And this chapter organizes the material by looking at biodiversity of pathogens, by looking at biodiversity of vectors that carry disease and hosts uh, that serve as uh, repositories or reservoirs of the disease and see how that affects these patterns. Chapter eight on food production on land and in the ocean, of course, the incredible diversity in soils. This is a a whole universe that we understand not a great deal about, uh, understanding more and more about the interactions of the enormous uh, variety and diversity and numbers of species and soils that keep it fertile. Chapter nine, this is my good friend Fred Kirshenman. Any of you who know Fred are uh, as honored as I am to know this uh, incredible guy. He's standing in front of his 3,700 acre organic farm in North Dakota, which he's farmed for over three decades. This chapter is on biodivers biodiversity and organic farming and genetically modified crops because it's not possible to really talk about this subject of biodiversity and food production without covering these enormously complex and controversial topics. And then finally, chapter 10 on what individuals can do to help conserve biodiversity. This is an image of a man in uh, Haiku, China, who's uh, uh, probably uh, won the record of recycling plastic uh, bottles. And this chapter offers a guide on the various things that people can do in building houses, driving cars, eating food, et cetera, that uh, will contribute uh, to preserving species and ecosystems. So in my remaining time, I want to go over some uh, case studies that are in the book. So the first is about polar bears. And these magnificent creatures, they've been on land for uh, about as long as our species, Homo sapiens, some 190,000 to 200,000 years. Uh, it's predicted, uh, as you have read in the, in the popular press, that they will uh, be extinct in the wild by the end of this century because of melting of the Arctic ice sheet. Uh, on which they depend for hunting their main food or seals because the, they wait for the seals to come up for air. And if the ice sheet is melted and all over the place, the seals can emerge 
uh, from underwater at a place where the polar bears are not waiting for them and, and the polar bears are starving in parts of the Arctic. Uh, the best studies are on the western uh, parts of the Hudson Bay. But when we talk about uh, the, these iconic uh, examples of, of what we will lose with climate change, the, their medicinal value, their medical value is rarely mentioned. Let me talk a bit about uh, hibernating or what are actually called denning bears. Bears don't fully hibernate uh, as uh, woodchucks and, and uh, ground squirrels and some other organisms do. They, they do have a reduced basal metabolic level. They're temperature drops, their heart rate drops, they're in a reduced state of awareness, but as, uh, as, as bear biologists have discovered to their dismay, who have gone into the den while they are denning, they are fully arousable rather uh, quickly. You have to get that uh, anesthetic dart in them very, very quickly. So like all bears that den, uh, these are denning, a uh, picture of a denning black bear mother and her cub, uh, polar bears uh, are essentially immobile for long, very long periods of time, five, seven months, even nine months in some, some occasions, and yet they don't lose bone mass. So every other mammal, including, by the way, these hibernating animals like ground squirrels and woodchucks, lose bone mass when they're immobile. All mammals do, including us. <clears throat> I won't get into the fact, but our, we're always reorganizing our, the architecture of our bone. We have cells that break down bone and cells that lay down new bone, and that process is a dynamic one that's always going on. And during immobility, the cells that our, are uh, taking away bone, resorbing bone, are active, are overly active uh, compared to the ones laying down new bone. So we lose about a third of our bone mass during the period of time that polar bears and other bears are denning. And so they have substances in their blood that prevent their becoming osteoporotic despite immobility for long periods of time. Osteoporosis is an enormous public health problem. It kills some 70,000 people in, in the United States every year, costs the U.S. economy $18 billion a year. Uh, for those of you who may have thinning of bone or, or loss of bone, you know that it's, it, you can take medication that stops the thinning, but you don't actually start laying down new bone. There are some uh, thoughts that there may be some ways of solving that, but these denning bears may contain within their bloodstreams substances that will help us prevent, treat, and maybe even prevent osteoporosis. Now, denning bears also don't eat, drink, urinate, or defecate for months at a time. They don't become dehydrated, they don't starve, and they don't become toxic. If we can't urinate for a few days, we're dead. We have to get rid of our urinary waste. There is actually no treatment for end-stage renal disease other than treat renal transplant or dialysis, which takes away the urinary waste. They somehow, not fully understood, recycle their urea, their urinary waste. They break it down into amino acids and they make new proteins, not fully understood. So denning bears, including polar bears, may have hold the secret for helping us uh, treat uh, renal failure. Now polar bears are unlike other denning bears in that they become massively obese. All, all denning bears become overweight uh, to get through the hibernation or the denning. But polar bears become massively obese. They, they have to stay warm longer in those conditions. They also den longer, uh, and they're eating seal blubber. And yet they don't develop type 2 diabetes. So we develop type 2 diabetes when we become obese. Type 2 diabetes related to obesity is almost epidemic in the United States. One could say it is. Some 16 million Americans, 6% of the population have obesity related type 2 diabetes. Again, polar bears may hold the secret for treating uh, this very difficult and lethal disease. So I want to talk quickly about cone snails. This is a large group of predatory snails. They live uh, on, in tropical coral reefs mostly. Uh, mostly. Most of the species are found in the South Pacific. And by predatory, I mean that they defend themselves and they uh, uh, paralyze their food by firing this uh, poison-coated harpoon at their prey. 
Now, what's amazing about cone snails, it's, it's been an evolutionary explosion on two, on two levels. They've only been around for about 35 million years, uh, but there's 700 different cone snail species, which is a very large number in the marine environment. But even more miraculous is that each cone snail species is thought to make 100 to 200 distinct toxins. So there may be as many as 140,000 different poisons that cone snails make. They're peptides. Their peptides are the same poisons that snakes and scorpions, sea anemones, spiders uh, have. Um, but in contrast to those organisms, the number of these toxins is off the charts, and they're very potent and enormously selective. They attach themselves to receptor sites on our membranes, all animal membranes, and it seems that the more of the, those that are studied, the clearer it is that they may be attaching themselves to every known receptor site uh, on our cells. So, of course, uh, people are looking for the potential for new medicines. Only six species have been studied in any detail out of 700. Only 100 toxins have been studied in any detail out of maybe 140,000. And there's several medicines in clinical trials, and one is on the market. Let me tell you about the one on the market. It's called Prealt. It's a synthetic form of one of these cone snail toxins. It is perhaps the most important breakthrough in pain treatment since morphine. It's a thousand times more potent than morphine. So that's one thing which is fascinating. But even more important is it doesn't lead to what's called tolerance. So for those of you who've ever known anyone or have been in yourself in long-term severe pain, you know that morphine is very effective. It's an incredible drug. I had surgery a couple of years ago. It's a life-saving drug. But what happens is if the pain is persistent and severe, you have to keep increasing the dose to get the same effect. That's called tolerance. And you run into two problems. One is that you may get other side effects like respiratory depression that limit the ability to increase the dose or the medication isn't as effective. This medication does not cause tolerance, the one from a cone snail. And that's in painkilling, like the discovery of penicillin. It's an enormous breakthrough. So moving quickly along. Oh, here's a cone snail a paralyzing a fish. So this is, uh, I want to talk very quickly about infectious disease. This is a 2002 map of the United States about showing cases of Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease is the, is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States. Uh, each of these dots is a case of Lyme, and you notice uh, that there's a concentration in the Middle Atlantic states and southern New England, uh, a smattering of cases, uh, a concentration in the upper Midwest, some smattering in the southeast, uh, Pacific Northwest, and California. And if you look carefully at the distribution of, of this uh, map, you'll see that this distribution parallels very closely the blue states in the last election. <laughs> now, this fact has caused some to conclude that Lyme may be having a positive effect on a portion of the brain where intelligence and judgment is located. But, you know, with the 2008 election, this map has to change, and Nevada has to be looked at, and Indiana, and New Mexico, and Ohio, and Virginia, and so scientists are suggesting we look at those states for cases of Lyme. This is all completely bogus. I just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. So, Lyme is a kind of comp is a complicated vector-borne disease. Uh, it's ve the vector is this uh, tick in the east. It's the eastern black-legged uh, tick. Uh, the uh, uh, the main host is this organism, the uh, white-footed mouse, and uh, uh, white white-tailed deer are also a host. Um, so it's it's what's important is that the tick is an omnivorous feeder. It will bite anything that crosses its path. Squirrels, chipmunks, uh, white-footed mice, our dog, our cat, us, and transmits the bacterial infection. It's a spirochete called Borrelia burgdorferi. So we get Lyme disease, but we are a dead-end host. In other words, 
we get the infection. It's circulating in our system, as anyone who's had Lyme knows, and it can affect, uh, especially if it's undetected, it can affect the nervous system, the cardiac system, the joints, etc. cetera. Um, but if another tick bites us, it can't pass on that infection to another organism. We're a dead-end host. Now, there are other hosts that are not dead-end hosts, but are incompetent hosts. In other words, they pass the infection on to some ticks that bite them, but not terribly well. But this guy, the white-footed mouse, which thrives in degraded environments, is a very competent host. The organism proliferates in its bloodstream, and another tick that bites it at a very high percentage passes on that infection to other organisms. So it was noticed that in areas where there was low vertebrate diversity, and this was paralleling areas that had degraded or fragmented forests, that there was a low rate of Lyme disease. And some very elegant studies by my friend Rick Ostfeld and his group at the Cary uh, Institute showed why, uh, why that was. And that was that if there's a lot of diversity of vertebrates, the infection gets diluted in all these incompetent and dead-end hosts. It doesn't carry on. The cycle of infection doesn't carry on. So the risk of a tick being infected in those environments is lower than in an area where there's low diversity and a lot of white-footed mice. Is that clear? The other thing is that if there's a lot of vertebrate diversity, there are organisms that are competing with this guy for food and keeping its population down, again, lowering the risk of our getting Lyme. And there are organisms that are predators of the white-footed mice. Where I, where I am and have a farm in Central Mass, we have weasels and red foxes and fishers and hawks and snakes, all of which love white-footed mice for lunch, keeping its population down, making the risk of getting Lyme less. So here's a really beautiful example of biodiversity and a major human infectious disease. And Rick and his colleagues are now looking at West Nile virus disease. Uh, there are parallels with schistosomiasis and other vector-borne diseases where this association between high vertebrate diversity and low risk of, of getting the disease for us is, is a, a, a strongly robust one. So, I want to end my talk by talking about three amphibians. I started talking about them, and I want to end with them. So the first is this organism. This looks like a, a rubber model of, a, of, a, of an animal, but it's actually a real photograph of the waxy monkey tree frog. Its Latin name is Phylomedusa savogi. It's found in dry prairie regions of South America. Now, this organism has in its skin antimicrobial compounds called dermaceptins, which are very potent, potent against the, some of the fungi that cause uh, death in people that have compromised immune systems, like people with HIV AIDS. But what's more important is that this organism, and actually all amphibians and many other uh, organisms uh, in nature, all other organisms in nature, including us, uh, make antimicrobial uh, peptides in their skin that protect them against infection. Now, one of the huge problems in medicine is the development of antibiotic resistance. It's a really a developing crisis. There are strains of tuberculosis that are unresponsive to essentially all of our antibiotics. There are strains of gram-negative bacteria, one called Klebsiella, uh, which is uh, very much spread in intensive care units, which, is resist which are resistant to uh, our antibiotics. So these frogs and others that make anti these antimicrobial peptides, their antimicrobial uh, compounds have been working for millions of years. So we need to study what are the strategies by which these compounds have continued to work without resistance uh, developing. Now, this whole story of chytrid fungi may be, uh, may be another uh, part of that story, and it's complicated to get into now. But um, let me tell you about another amphibian, this guy. Hard to believe that's a real organism, but it is. That's the crucifix toad, Notoden bonetti also called the Holy Cross toad 
it's the pattern on its back is in the shape of a cross. So this toad lives in southeastern Australia. It's underground for as long as nine months of the year. That's a story in and of itself. Um, and it comes up from the dried mud when the rains come and it emerges. And it's very prone to attack by insects that are trying to bite it. It secretes a very sticky protein-based glue in its skin that you can see these, uh, these little, um, um, uh, you know, uh, translucent and um, uh, shiny uh, bubbles on its skin. Now, for the surgical repair of human tissue, there's always been a need for a very strong glue. Now, we have very strong glues, like super glue, very strong, uh, but they're toxic and they're brittle, and uh, even more important in some ways is that they don't allow for the diffusion of, of fluids and gases and cells. So if you use them to repair a tissue, what you want to do with tissue repair with a glue is to have the glue serve as a temporary holder so that the normal reparatory processes of the body, the sec making fibrous tissue to really re repair the wound, will then take over. So the cells and the gases and the fluids have to, have to diffuse uh, through the glue. That can't happen with uh, super glue. So there's been a search for biological glue, and there are biological glues, as you, as you know, um, but they're not very strong. But this glue is enormously strong, and it has been used uh, in experimental ways and is, is now being uh, considered for surgical orthopedic repair to glue things that have very high torque uh, tension in them, like a torn meniscus cartilage in your knee that happened, unfortunately, to our New England Patriots quarterback, Tom Brady. Could have used this glue. Um, so this is an enormous, again, a very important thing for surgical repair. Finally, this amphibian. This is a gastric brooding frog, one, one of the species. There are two species that were discovered in Australian rainforests. The female swallows the fertilized eggs, which then hatch in her stomach, become tadpoles, and when they reach a certain level of development, like here, the female vomits them out into an aquatic environment where they complete their uh, development into adults, and then they reproduce, and the cycle starts all over again. Well, all amphibians, all vertebrates, us, begin the process of digestion in our stomachs. When food reaches the stomach, a set of triggers uh, occurs where acid uh, is, uh, messages to release acid and enzymes begin and food begins to get broken down. Well, not surprisingly, gastric brooding frog tadpoles inhibited that process, secreted compounds that prevented their being digested, also prevented their being emptied into the small intestine, which is another uh, set of events that occurs after uh, a period of time. And there was enormous interest in what these compounds were uh, because peptic ulcer disease is a huge public health problem. Again, 25 million Americans have peptic ulcer disease, and you can take medicines like Prilosec, which stop the acid, um, and that's very helpful. But these compounds may have worked by a completely different pathway and may have been much, much more effective than anything we have on the market to treat peptic ulcer disease, which causes a lot of suffering uh, in, in people. So they tried to characterize them, but all the, the experiments had to stop before they found out uh, what the compounds were, because both species of gastric brooding frogs, the only ones known anywhere in the world, went extinct. And those compounds, which may have evolved over millions of years, what they were, how they worked, will never be known. No one will ever know what they were. That information is gone forever. So in closing, I want to just read uh, a bit from the preface and from the dedication, um, because they both will say more clearly and uh, movingly anything I could think about saying in conclusion. So from the preface, quote, scientists with expertise in a wide range of disciplines from industrialized and developing countries alike have been involved in putting this book together. We have done so because we are convinced that it can help people understand 
that human beings are an integral part of nature and that our health ultimately depends on the health of its species and on the natural functioning of its ecosystems. We have done so because all of us hope that our efforts will help guide policymakers in developing innovative and equitable policies based on sound science that will effectively preserve biodiversity and promote human health for generations to come. And we have done so finally because we all believe that life on Earth is sacred and that we must never give up in trying to preserve it, and because we all share the conviction that once people recognize how much is at stake with their health and lives and with the health and lives of their children, they will do everything in their power to protect the global environment." End of quote. And finally, the dedication. We dedicate this book to the millions of plant, animal, and microbial species we share this small planet with and to our own species, Homo sapiens, who first walked on Earth some 195,000 years ago and struggled to survive over the millennia to become the magnificent and extraordinarily powerful beings we are today. May we have the wisdom and the love for our children and all children to come to use that power to save the indescribably beautiful and precious gift we have been given. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in terms of your opening comments about being between two, the two of us, um, just from the beginning to be clear, I, I'm less Degas and more her block. So <laughs> you just so you know where I fit in the in the artistic. Uh, firmament. Uh, when I was asked to, to look at the book and make some comments, you know, I tried to think what, what connecting tissue might I find between the Natural Capital Project and, and this uh, remarkable publication. And so I decided I'd start out with the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment as sort of a starting point, make some comments about the book itself, uh, talk just very briefly of what describe what the Natural Capital Project is and where it fits in this uh, uh, in the environmental movement, and then end with a couple of sort of comments about some of the controversy around this uh, anthropocentric, anthropocentric approach to, to conservation, uh, just as a way to sort of stir the pot a little bit. But at the beginning of the modern environmental movement, it sort of broke into two separate strains, and it, essentially the brown issues that people were concerned about, pollution and uh, environmental justice, and human health got sort of lumped into that, that stream of concern. And then there were the green issues, and then eventually with marine, the blue issues of nature conservation, and that, that had a different sort of strain of concern, and it focused on protecting rare and endangered species, and then eventually expanded to deal with biodiversity writ large. But I think human health was, was not a central part of that thinking. It was just not something that, that was sort of a dominant theme of, of the uh, green part of the environmental movement. And we focused on you know, creating na parks, national parks, international parks regulation, but that was sort of where we were looking. And a lot of our <coughs> arguments were they were aesthetic, they were scientific, uh, they were ethical. Um, we appealed to national pride. I mean, we used whatever tools we could get our hands on. Uh, but Tom knows this uh, uh, very well. I mean, we struggle with the fact that most biodiversity is in the poor parts of the world. You're dealing with, with very poor people in rural areas. And arguments that don't address the issue of humans are very hard to sustain in that kind of environment. And that's why, for a lot of us, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was so valuable. It was finished in 2005, and it really provided a framework to bring human systems, social systems, and natural systems together and provided a sort of intellectual connection back between the issues of people and the issues of, of the environment, and particularly the issues of natural environment. But as we've worked on these issues, that provided a sort of a, an umbrella framework but these connections are really complicated, and if, if you had any doubts about it, I think we, we've just had a brilliant uh, description of the complexity of these relationships. And a lot of the parts of Millennium Ecosystem Assessment feels very theoretical. 
And so we're getting pushed for evidence. You know, give us examples, give us specificity. Uh, and that's a large part of what the Natural Capital Project is trying to look at, is to take this concept and this idea and how do we make it real. Uh, and that's why this, this book, Sustaining Life, How Human Health Depends on Biodiversity, is just such an enormous contribution. Um, and just a couple of comments that, that, uh, that I had when I looked at it. I mean, it's a massive synthesis of scientific knowledge of showing the link between people and the natural world, particularly human health. Uh, and if it just compiled this information, it would have been, it would be an enormous contribution. But it's done it in the most elegant and, in fact, a really beautiful publication that is a coffee table uh, quality. I mean, the, the, the production itself is really quite elegant and compelling. And I think that if you look at it, it's, you know, for people, it's a wonderful rebuttal to people who call conservationists tree huggers. Because if you really look at the content of this book, um, you should go out and hug a tree. Um, I mean, you ought to go out and hug a Pacific yew tree, uh, which I think is probably one of the better known examples. But it was a trash tree that was gotten rid of during, during timbering operations until it was discovered that it was a source of taxol, which is effective in trying to create remissions in ovarian and other kinds of cancer. Or if you read about the, or, the origin of warfarin. Warfarin, is that pronounced right? Warfarin. Warfarin. Right. It's the drug of choice to prevent and treat blood clots. Uh, and you might be moved to go dance in a field of sweet clover, which is where some of the original thinking came from to understand where this, how this drug could be developed. If you wake up at night worried about heart attacks or have nightmares about Ebola, you might want to go hug a canine hookworm because the saliva may be a source of treatment. And if you're interested in understanding the human immune system, you should go pet an Atlantic hagfish, which, and they, we should stop fishing it to create, to create leather uh, because it may be a potential source of, of a solution. And I find it interesting that I went through and looked for some interesting examples, and we didn't overlap at all. I don't know how that happened. Right. Right. But, a, but a, a local example that, that I, you know, that I personally have experienced. When I first moved to the East Coast from California, I did the usual summer pilgrimage down to the Delaware shore, and this is in the mid-70s, and was just astonished by the abundance of horseshoe crabs in this sort of prehistoric, fascinating uh, species that doesn't exist in the, on the Pacific Coast. And my kids were fascinated by these. They were everywhere. Uh, and it's just, you're watching it decline over the years, just a slow, non-scientific, just observation process of watching this disappear when something that had been so abundant. And if you read pages 278 to 283, or you can ask Eric, uh, you know why we should care about the disappearance of horseshoe crab as much as we care about the disappearance of the panda or worry about the rhino. I mean, the, the connections between the horseshoe crab and what we learn is so complicated, nuanced. I mean, it's, it's really quite a miraculous story. And I think the, the thing I got as I looked at these examples is, I mean, there are just they're so many of them. You could just pick out stories. You could spend months picking out little examples to use, is how rarely the line to discovery between the species and the discovery is just not a straight line. It's a series of accidents, serendipity of looking at this, finding this as an example, somebody picking it up. And so when people say, well, look at this species disappearing, you know, what good is it? The idea that there is a sort of direct link between a species and the value is, is just a really not understanding the process of discovery, which is so well documented, this sort of journey of insight that the book, the book carries. So these are just a few examples. I mean, these are particularly species, but the whole problem of destabilization of the natural environment and the impact on spread of disease, uh, the encouragement of invasive pest species, the loss of insight uh, into threats that we, we that haven't even appeared yet. Um, you know, there's the discussion about agriculture and how diversity has helped uh, increase efficiency in the green revolution. But traditional agricultural diversity also may turn out to be absolutely critical where Traditional people have spread risk by having many different species. And as we deal with climate change and climate variability, we may suddenly find that efficiency, it may not be the only virtue, that the ability to deal with 
volatility and climate may turn out to be absolutely critical. And we're going to have to go back to some of these traditional species and to see where we can put, get insight into how to deal with these issues. So as I thought about what you try to get out of a book like this, I mean, I think the, the most powerful part of it is the statement of the problem. And it does it extremely well. It, you then need to get, have people you need to understand the consequences of the problem. And I think the book does that equally well. The consequences is not just a biodiversity loss to the world, but very directly to us. And I think it's a very powerful motivation to act. So I think it's, it's, it's really a remarkable achievement in all, three, in all three areas. If I can switch directions just a little bit and talk a bit about the Natural Capital Project, so where this fits in, because it's part of the same struggle of how do we show why natural systems matter to people. And in this case, it's biodiversity and it's human health. And human health is not something that we've tackled in, in uh, the Natural Capital Project, so it's an enormously valuable contribution. And when I look at the work that went into this, I'm delighted that we haven't taken that on. Uh, but it is, a, it is a collaboration between Stanford, World Wildlife Fund, and the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and the focus is on how to improve how lands and waters are managed by showing the economic and life-sustaining life services that nature provides to people. Um, and so what, the main focus of what we've, we've been looking at the last sort of 18 months to two years, which is how long it's been around, is to create a series of tools that can be used to try to actually help document where, does, where are ecosystem services, how much comes off of landscapes, and how changes in landscape can change services, how trying to increase one service might come at the expense of another service. So if we decide to put everything into carbon, what is it going to mean for biodiversity and water? So trying to understand how these services work together. And so a group of scientists primarily based at Stanford have developed a modeling tool called INVEST, which stands for Integrated Valuation of Ecosystem Services and Trade-offs. And so this is what we've been working on, is trying to model these series of land use changes and services and how they fit together. And it has just been released uh, in a beta version in, no in November of last year. It's looking primarily at terrestrial and systems, and we've just gotten a grant from the Moore Foundation to begin to look at the marine systems as well. And to complement the science, the biophysical evaluation tool, we've been looking at a screening tool to try to help people understand should you consider an ecosystem service approach, particularly a payment for ecosystem service approach, is the, is the human environment, the institutional environment right to actually try to make one of these programs work? And then the two partners, World Wildlife Fund and Nature Conservancy, are taking these tools to the field and trying to make sure they work so that we don't have the researchers going off getting more and more elegant and creating a tool that actually can't be applied. One of the things that came out of that process is the modeling tool has two levels of complexity depending on the amount of data you have because the quick thing that came back from the field is there isn't a lot of data in a lot of places. You've got, if you're going to make this useful, you have to have a model that actually can operate on relatively limited amount of da data. And then, so the main focus of the Natural Capital Project really has been on taking an idea, the idea that, that humans depend on ecosystem services, and say, how do we create the, the scientific and policy tools to make it operational? So we have a somewhat different approach than what you've used, but it's driven by the same fundamental idea of how do we go back and reconnect the importance of natural systems and biodiversity to people and how do we make the case that these things matter. Um, so I'll just close with a couple of observations that seems so obvious that you would think that it would be a, you know, everybody would agree with it and I think it's pretty widely accepted. But there is a lot of discomfort in the environmental community itself and to a certain extent in the development community about an ecosystem service approach, particularly about the economic aspects of it. So I, I think it's, it's worth at least putting those on the table. This isn't a universally accepted way to go. And why would, they, why would there be concerns? I think part of the problem we've had with ecosystem services is it's been 
defined almost exclusively as payments for ecosystem services, and it's very much become sort of the poster child for market approaches. So the market's going to solve everything. We're just going to get everybody to pay for things, and it'll all work out fine. So the importance of public goods, the role of regulation in government has sort of been lost. And so I think the, this, this, this making ecosystem services synonymous with markets, I think, is one of the real issues that I struggle with, trying to say it's much more complicated than that, and it's got a major public goods aspect. I think some of the concerns are philosophical. Uh, they, people worry that treating nature as a commodity is going to diminish ethical arguments for its conservation. I think another concern is people worry that if we start paying people, are we going to start paying people to do things that they should do as members of a society? Do you have to pay everybody every time you want them to do something good? Is that, do we want to go down that road? Uh, some are worried if we start monetizing, are we just going to get outbid? Uh, we, you know, we could, we're getting into a different, difficult road. Mm -hmm. is, it, 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 is it a competitive argument? Are we going to end up with an argument of what's more important, ecosystem services or biodiversity? Are we going to find ourselves arguing about that? And then for some of the environmental groups, they're worried about mission drift. They say, we don't really know how to do this. You know, don't get straight away. So one of our three partners, the Nature Conservancy, had a major staff retreat, and they had a debate about should they include ecosystem services uh, as part of their core mission. And it was about 50-50. You know, and this is the converted. So we only have half the choir. Uh, so there's still a lot of discussion about this approach. Um, and even among conservationists who do support ecosystem services, for a lot of them, it's really, it's, an, it's not an end in itself. It's simply a goal to get to our traditional conservation concerns. And primarily, it's a goal to find new, fun new funding to get to our traditional concerns. And that's fine up to a point. But if you look at it as a revenue source only, you don't make the investments in the science that you need to actually figure out how to do this right. And so that, that aspect worries me a bit. The other side of it, in the development community, and in, in people worried about development issues, particularly in the South, one of the issues we deal with is the fundamental suspicion in the South about market arguments coming from the North. Uh, you know, this is, this, they see this as part of the Northern market argument, and they see a concern about social impact, the social impacts of market arguments being applied to resources that are often survival resources. And their view is you, know, you take a resource that poor depend on and you show its value, who loses? It's often the poor. And so there's, there's real anxiety about, about that. And the complexity of, it's one thing to do a model about trade-offs between services. How do you deal with trade-off between service beneficiaries? So there's, there, there's some suspicion in that community. On the other hand, and this is really, I'm wrapping up at this point, uh, a lot of those in the development community see this as a really nice addition to the conservation argument that species and hotspots have been the dominant argument, and they see this concern about ecosystems for people as a chance for the environmental community to, to reestablish its connection to human needs. And so for a place where it works very nicely together is in Madagascar trying to convince the World Bank to fund and the government to triple the size of the park system. And one strong argument was the enormous diversity of Madagascar. But in fact, the tourism there is still economically a relatively small, uh, a small driver in the country. But these forests provide the water that sustains the whole rice economy of the country. So it's not one or the other. You have these arguments that you can work together. So, the, so the, this is still a debate going on in the community. I, to my, my point of view, this link back to people-oriented conservation, not as an exclusive argument, but to really reestablish that we talk about people, we talk about nature, we're not trying to separate them. We really need to understand that these two, these are t are together, and we have to work together. And that really motivates uh, the natural capital project and uh, sustaining life. I think is going to be just a remarkable milestone. I mean, I would in the ecosystem service area, I'd give anything to have the equivalent. Uh, publication that so effectively makes the argument down to a level of detail and precision that is uh, really convincing. I defy anybody to read this and not walk away uh, both worried and sort of inspired uh, 
by how we fit into this larger universe. So I think you've done a great job, and I compliment you and your co-authors. You're very kind. Thank you, Tom, Eric, and Michael. It really is um, an awful lot you've given us to, to think about and, and to chew on for a moment. Um, we're going to have a discussion. As I mentioned, uh, the session is being broadcast on the web so that those folks can uh, hear your questions. I ask that you wait till one of my colleagues comes to you with a microphone. Let us know who you are and where you're coming from and, and, and pose your question. So why don't we, uh, why don't we get that started? Uh, yep, with Steve right there. And let me also say before Steve uh, Osofsky starts that uh, we, the copies of the book are for sale outside for a bookseller, so I urge you to, to, to pick that up. So, Steve. Well, thank you very much. Steve Osofsky from the Wildlife Conservation Society. <clears throat> I want to put you on the spot just a little bit, I think. I mean, Jeff, I'm thinking back to the sessions that you hosted on uh, health and forests. And there was, I can't remember the country, there was a minister of... Um, of health from a Latin American country who gave a, a very quick example of uh, logging concessions that had made X amount of money that came into the central coffers. But when they looked years later at the amount of malaria that that logging generated, that it was a net loss for the country in terms of the public health impacts. And we often don't do that calculus. And, and Michael, you and I have talked uh, uh, quite a bit now about the economic arguments as you know, something we can add to the toolbox in terms of health as an ecosystem service. So my question to you, if we think about carbon, we think about water, do you think there's a model sort of combining the best of the natural capital project and, and the work that, that Eric and colleagues have done, starting to think about, uh, you know, in terms of persuasive arguments, health itself as an eco ecosystem service, the relationship between ecological intactness and real health benefits that have real dollar values that governments can relate to. Um, it's sort of really creating the model, Michael, that, that we don't have in ecosystem services, obviously very complex, but again, one of the most compelling arguments we could make. Is that conceptually feasible to, to, to do something like that, you think? So it's for all of you. Just ask a, quick, a, quick, a quick question. I mean, are, are you essentially saying a model to prove a, I mean, it's sort of a backwards. You know, here are the health costs if you do, it's more prevention. Right? You're exactly. talking about the, it's, it's, the economic benefit of preventative. Exactly. It's really what, what will you benefit, you know, in, from the health point of view if you don't destroy ecosystem X, Y, or Z. It's, it's intuitively obvious to, I'm sure, all of us here, but we haven't really been able to make that yeah. argument coherently. Yeah. One, one very interesting thing that we, we talk about in the chapter on infectious disease, but we don't really answer the question because it's, it's not fully understood. But one, one thing that happens with degraded environments like forests uh, is that you, you decrease the diversity of the vectors like mosquitoes carrying malaria or snail hosts for schistosomiasis. But you end up selecting for uh, more powerful vectors for human disease. Not really understood why that happens, but that does seem to happen. So uh, the, the, uh, the argument that the health costs of uh, these degraded systems, like deforested areas, uh, are potentially huge, uh, both from schistosomiasis or malaria, um, or in Argentina when the pampas were converted into cornfields and Argentine hemorrhagic fever raced through uh, those areas of Argentina is, is one that I, I actually don't know the literature, but I don't think there's, Tom, Tom may know, uh, the numbers really need to be gathered and submitted as uh, one of the most powerful arguments for preservation of these systems. Tom, do you know? So uh, I'm not aware of, of anybody having really gone at it systematically. Uh, and just a little note of caution here. I mean, it's not going to be uniformly the case, right? Right. Uh, right. And I mean, just to be hugely simple-minded about it, uh, you know, there are, I'm sure, plenty of examples of human health being improved because a natural ecosystem was turned into an agricultural base. Uh, so 
one needs to be just really careful and thoughtful about how one does it. Uh, that caveat aside, however, uh, as we press more and more on sort of the last natural havens of the world and basically make the biological systems more turbulent, uh, I think the odds go up of negative consequences. My name is Stephen Short. Uh, there is a debate um, uh, in terms of making areas suitable for human cultivation. Uh, for example, in Africa, there's uh, substantial parts of the continent are not considered suitable because of the tsetse fly, and people speak if the fly could be eradicated, these areas would be suitable for agriculture and more people w could be fed, And there's, but there's the counter that we really don't know the consequences. Even if we could eradicate the tsetse fly, this might lead to other unforeseen problems. So my question is, does your book go into detail on what the consequences might be of eradicating species like the tsetse fly in Africa or the Chagas beetle in South America? No. <laughs> um, there, there is discussion of, of those organisms and what is known, but I think some of the points you're raising are not terribly well understood. Um, so we, we haven't, haven't really uh, covered that. I'm trying to remember, uh, and I didn't write this section of the book, um, about the tsetse fly. There, uh, what's the story? This is embarrassing. I should know every page of this book since I've read it over so many times. But when Idi Amin uh, came to power, some other people may know this story better than I, and uh, drove farmers out of some of the uh, areas that were being cultivated. Um, the uh, tsetse fly uh, had a great resurgence in, in population uh, because some of those farms, if I'm remembering this correctly, and I wish I had the book in front of me so I could read it, um, were replaced by, a, uh, by cattle uh, that were uh, then uh, grazing in those areas and by uh, vegetation that led to a greater uh, population of tsetse flies and the incidence of trypanosomiasis increased significantly in that area. I don't know if you're familiar with that. but um, So we do talk about that particular uh, case study, but some of the questions you're raising are, uh, are not fully covered. Right behind you, Will. I'm Tom Brooks from Conservation International. Thank you very much for a, a wonderful presentation. Um, my question concerns option value, um, <clears throat> the rationale <clears throat> for preventing extinctions because of the potential values, the potential unknown values that biodiversity can deliver to humanity. Um, and I think that the six wonderful concluding examples that you illustrated your talk with um, gave a very, very powerful case studies of, of realization of option value. Um, indeed, I think that option value arguments are some of the most powerful arguments that we have for the importance of conserving biodiversity. What I'd like to know is what you see as the next step for um, recognizing the importance of option value to the global economy and, and society. How, how do we move, how do we build from case studies to, 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 to measure option value or to map option value and to increasingly feed it into, feed it into to, 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 to planning such that it can, such that it can ultimately be be maximized and hopefully as a, as a result we can, we can retain our global biodiversity. Thanks. <laughs> I fall back on that. I'm just a lawyer defense. You know, <laughs> uh, 
Boy, I'm not, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. I mean, I think one of the things that uh, we've struggled with is we have some really good small group of economists working with us, but they're really a niche, a niche group who are interested in these connections. And trying to figure out how do we capture more of the economic uh, profession and bring them into these discussions to take the kind of information that that you've come up with with specific examples but how can you begin to generalize beyond that and I think we've got to we've got to broaden the uh, community of people that we're, we're trying to engage in this I mean the the appeal to doctors and to the health profession I mean I found the person I wanted to give this book to was a, was a doctor friend of mine I wouldn't have thought of giving a book on biodiversity to a doctor friend of ours. So I guess maybe I'll throw it back to you. How do we reach out to the economics community? How do we get University of Chicago's you know, business school and, and economics department thinking about these issues? How do we crack that profession? Um, I don't know. I mean, as long as it's done by the sort of, you started out with the renegades on the side, but at some point we need to bring that profession in if this is going to be accepted as a convincing mainline argument. And I, how to do that, I think, is one of the things we've been challenged to do is take the models that we've put together once they're in decent shape and pull together a group of, you know, non-converted economists and say, have a go at us. You know, what's wrong? What do we do? How do we do it better? And really start that debate, which I think probably does have to happen. We can't just keep talking to ourselves and our, and our small coterie of, of colleagues. But we haven't taken that step yet. I don't think we're quite ready for it. I mean, the <clears throat> one of the figures that I, I didn't give is the figure for uh, type 2 diabetes in this country. Uh, that's $91 billion a year for the economy. You're talking real money, and when we're looking at the health care system and we're trying to figure out how to provide coverage for large numbers of people and 5% of the country has this disease, um, I, th I think it has becomes a, a fairly powerful argument. Um, uh, but clearly the much greater numbers are the ecosystem service numbers. Uh, if we lose pollinators uh, in large area, agricultural areas of the country, what's that going to do to the economy? Uh, what's that going to do to people's accessibility to food in some parts of the world? Uh, those numbers are are huge. Uh, um. have somebody in the back, and then we'll bring it down here in the front for you. Guys. Leon Kalankowitz, I am a consulting wildlife biologist uh, who does a lot of conservation planning at National Wildlife Refuges with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service around the country. And before that, uh, in an earlier life, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Central America, working in uh, trying to protect. Uh, natural areas, both national parks and wildlife refuges in Central America. And one of the arguments that we used to make all the time in trying to convince so-called host country nationals of the value of conservation, well, los beneficios de las áreas silvestres, as we would say in Spanish, the benefits of wild areas, was ecotourism, which uh, one or two of you had addressed. Uh, and yet, even when that is successful, such as in a Costa Rican model or a uh, is it um, where the mountain gorillas are, Rwanda, I believe, it can bring its own problems. And I wonder about how truly sustainable it is if it's depending on long distance travel from the wealthy north at a time of peak oil and the climbing, not right now, of course, but over the long term, likely climbing energy prices and difficulty in getting to these places and then providing economic input that local people can, can uh, feel that they have a reason to protect them for. That would uh, be true in Africa, would be true in the Galapagos Islands, where right now as a result of the explosion in ecotourism, the island fauna is actually under tremendous stress from the population boom that that economic success story has, has represented for the Galapagos. Uh, so at any rate, I guess this is just a cautionary note that even some of the solutions that are being proposed can bring their own problems or may not be sustainable. Call on your African wildlife. Days. Well, I, I, I mean, I think that's right. If it's not managed well, it can create enormous problems. And this question of is it sustainable over the long run, well, I think a lot of the solutions that we're trying to work on may not 
work in 20 years from now. We're playing for time and we're trying to keep options open. You know, my, we may, there may be a completely different reason to pr protect gorillas 30 years from now. I think tourism, if it's done well, can make sure that 30 years from now there's still gorillas and, and other arguments may, may develop. I mean, the Virunga Mountains are enormously important for water. I mean, the water that comes off those mountains supports one of the most densely populated pl places on Earth. So it's not just the gorillas. There are a number of other arguments as well. But in many of these cases, I think this idea of looking for permanent solutions that we can just say, okay, we got that one solved, it isn't going to happen. This isn't like putting a man on the moon at the end of the century. I mean, we're going to be fine-tuning, finding new arguments, building on it. You know, the next generation is going to be doing that. So, you know, there aren't any permanent solutions here. Uh, but I think we're adding an ever-growing array of tools and arguments, and we just need to keep building those as we go. Uh, we had uh, kind of three here in the middle and Mona over here. Why don't we collect a couple, so come down to the front of the room. I'm uh, Joseph Dudley from Science Applications International Corporation. I think this is a semi-historic event because I think this is the first non-black tie event that I've seen with a panel in which Tom Lovejoy was not the only person <laughs> with a blue tie, bow tie. Well, that's because I've hung around him many, many years. <laughs> it just rubs off. Um, we, we, have him, we have them, you know, bookend. That's though, right. The, you know, Contained, I, even. Yeah. I thought that needed to be noted. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the market argument, as, as people said, is, I mean, we went through this at, at the National Forum on Biodiversity. Stephen Jay Gould the audience almost wanted to take him out tar and feather him because he wouldn't say, uh, he said that biodiversity was an aesthetic argument. Uh, but people didn't understand his worldview and his politics and as a, 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 a Marxist, uh, aesthetics to him was morals. And so, but I think it's important and I think Mike addressed this, which is you're hitting a constituency, a, perhaps a new and valuable constituency. And, and it's an under-accessed uh, under constituency for biodiversity. And, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. But I think that's an important key. We need to get all the different potential constituencies that are out there engaged because they can have huge impacts. Uh, for example, there was a case of a well-meaning research scientist at the National Institutes of Health, and this feeds back to the global spread of chytrid fungus and amphibian declines that we started out with, who released African clawed frogs that were used as controls in medical laboratory studies on, into stream on the NIH campus which feeds into Rock Creek, which feeds into the Potomac River, which feeds into the Chesapeake Bay and all that. And one of the properties of African clawed frogs is that they are a primary host of the chytrid fungus. So this well-meaning medical researcher, and this was a PhD person, this was not a lab technician type. Uh, may have been personally responsible for the introduction of chytrid fungus to the Rock Creek watershed and the Potom Potomac River watershed ecosystem. So, you know, with just that as the poster child for your book alone, uh, th this is a huge, a second hugely important part of, of this event, that, you know, it, reaching this particular community uh, at this particular time, I think, is, is extremely noteworthy, and, and I want to thank you all for that. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. If you could mm -hmm. just hand it to your neighbors there. Can, can I just make a sure. quick comment? One of the frustrating things about doing this work uh, in looking at the relationship of ecology or biodiversity to medicine is how... Uh, difficult it has been to bring the medical community uh, into these issues. And it's particularly frustrating because we were so successful with the nuclear issue. 
Um, you know, we had at one time, international physicians had 250,000 physician members in 80 countries uh, around the world. Um, and one would think this would be a far easier sell, but it hasn't been. And I'm not sure I understand all the reasons for it. I mean, you know, the the 80s uh, was a very different time from the 90s and, and the new millennium in terms of all kinds of things for medical practitioners, etc. But But it's been, uh, it's not that it's not happening, but it's been much slower than I would have anticipated. But it is an enormously important uh, constituency to involve in these issues, for sure. Yes, uh, Peter Lee with NOAA. Uh, I have your book at my desk. It arrived about uh, a week or so ago. And this past Monday at our biodiversity meeting, that's at the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, uh, I showed our committee and the committee chair, you know, your book. And uh, really it was, uh, even in awe, they were in awe, you know, the scope, the breadth, the depth. But uh, if I could be a little bit both pessimistic and honest, um, I remember starting working for NOAA 20 years ago, about 1990, and working with the climate office at the Office of Chief Scientist. When, arri when I arrived, they hand handed me the first IPCC documents, and my boss said, read this. So I did. And it's a vast amount of knowledge, just like your book. And I admire the scientists that are advancing our knowledge, but knowledge is not action. So my question is, how do we mobilize to create a world that is sustainable in that under the assumption from where I sit with, with all the veritables in, at, in play right now, with the atmosphere being loaded along with population increase and the list is endless by the thousands and the synergisms that cross um, complementary forces for which we don't even know about in the what I would refer to as the ecological unconscious uh, stuff that's happening that we don't even perceive yet. Um, I am concerned to quote from uh, Richard Leakey's book, uh, The Sixth Extinction, as we approach it. Um, how are we going to change in spite of the fact we're at the first iteration IPCC, the fourth iteration? And every year that passes, in spite of all these assessments, CO2 is increasing, not decreasing, or stabilizing. And biodiversity, I presume, but you guys tell me, you're the experts, I presume, is equally decreasing and poised to, to, for a nonlinear event. So help me, inform me, how do we get to the point, because you guys really did, have done a great job telling me, like the Surgeon General, that smoking is bad for me and I'm going to get cancer, but guess what, I'm still smoking. God, is this, is this all for me? <laughs> okay. Um, it's, a, it's a complicated and, uh, question and a very long answer. And um, let me just say a few words about it. Um, as I started at the beginning of my talk, the, the biggest concern that I have is that separation that people feel from the natural world. And you can see it in all, in, in many, many ways. And when you think about the success stories uh, about global environmental uh, uh, action, policy uh, decisions that really made a difference, one of the ones that we talked about a lot in the course that we taught at Harvard Medical School for 10 years was the whole Montreal Protocol and chlorofluorocarbons. So these were ubiquitous. Uh, they were refrigerants, they were cleaning agents, they were propellants. Uh, many, many industries uh, relied on them. Um, and when the ozone hole uh, was discovered, 
over the Antarctic in the mid-80s. Uh, that became uh, sort of the beginning of a wake-up call and led to the international community really taking this seriously and doing something quite significant about it. I mean, the problem is still there, but uh, much, much less than uh, it was. So the question is, how, why was that successful? So uh, many of the students we had wrote papers on this, and it's not an exact analogy to climate change or loss of biodiversity. It's much, much, much simpler on so many levels. You know, it wasn't the basis of our economy, the way fossil fuels are. Uh, it, uh, we could change our behavior fairly simply. There was an alternative. DuPont came up with a more ozone-friendly CFC. Uh, but one thing, two aspects about it, I think, are relevant to the question you ask. One is that the ozone hole, which, you know, wasn't really a hole, it was a thinning of ozone over the Antarctic, but it was portrayed as a hole, that there was this shield that was protecting the Earth, and there was a hole that we made in the shield. So there was this concrete image that people could kind of think about and could get. They could, they could relate to it. And what went through that hole were dangerous rays that caused cancer. And you know, we really got action when we found out that those dangerous rays were over Kennebunkport, in fact, not just in the Antarctic. Uh, and then there was some, some real interest in doing something about that. So I think the lesson here, as I say, it's much, much less complicated a story than what we're talking about here on many, many, many levels. But the lesson is make things as concrete as possible. Make them as personal as possible. Translate them into things that people that are a part of people's everyday lives. That's why we've, tr we've been talking about health. The IPCC has done a good job with that. But, you know, uh, I, I guess this is on tape, but, you know, some corporations spent millions of dollars trying to discredit the IPCC. Uh, they're now good guys. They run ads in the paper all the time about the wonderful work they're doing. But so there was a major campaign to discredit the science and scientists. Uh, and that has not uh, helped these efforts. But I think there are lessons to be learned about some of the successes that, uh, and I think health uh, and human well-being are, are a big piece of, of making that, those issues concrete uh, and part of people's everyday lives. Tom. Well, let me, let me take another uh, crack at uh, uh, what you raised. Uh, <clears throat> You know, biodiversity integrates all environmental problems. Nothing's called an environmental problem unless it affects living systems. Uh, so it is, therefore, you know, just a huge, gigantic problem to, to deal with. And it is often like running up a down escalator. Uh, but having said that, uh, you know, there, there is an increasing number of uh, scientists, and this is not just a scientist game in any case, but there's an increasing number of scientists who work on the interface between science and public policy and public awareness. Uh, and it is, it is very easy just to look at how daunting the challenge is and just feel almost hopeless about it. But if you take enough time to think about some of the things that have been achieved, uh, it gives you reason to really think you can make a difference. And I'll give my very personal example. I've spent a lot of time over the last 43 years uh, working in the Amazon. And, you know, it's a huge area. It looks small on our maps because of the Mercator projection, but it's equal to the 48 continental states, right? Uh, when I first arrived in 1965, in that huge area, there were three million people and one road. And we've read a lot since about more roads and 
destruction and you know huge numbers and smoke clouds as big as Brazil hanging over the continent and blah blah blah. Uh, what you don't read about <coughs> in a way that gives you a perspective uh, is that in that same period of time, that same area, and I'll just take the Brazilian two-thirds, uh, has gone from having one national forest to a level where something like 40 percent of the Brazilian Amazon is under some kind of protection. Some national parks, some indigenous areas, state governors now care about these things. Uh, just like California is head of the United States on climate change, this, the governor of Amazonas, which is 2.3 times the size of Texas, is the head of his government and looking for uh, carbon payments for keeping forest intact, started an experimental program in a state in which communities that find ways to uh, pursue their aspirations in life uh, without destroying the forest, get a community grant. Uh, so nobody would ever have dreamed that would have been possible. And so I like to say, you know, if you just work at it and think about it long enough, sometimes the impossible becomes possible. I guess I'll just throw my mind similar to, to Tom's, but we each of us take a different take of how do you keep doing this after all these years? And I actually am remarkably hopeful, and I think that Tom's is very specific. I use a different milestone, which is I remember when we started, uh, I remember giving the first grant when we were both at World Wildlife Fund to what I think was the first NGO, the first indigenous NGO in Latin America. It was a little group in Costa Rica. There weren't Latin American NGOs. This was the gringos coming down helping. And if you look at the quality of leadership and the diversity and the numbers of conservationists in Latin America, that in Africa, the last decade, the number of young Africans working in conservation is astonishing. And they're, they're absolutely remarkable people and they have every reason to be off earning more money doing something else but they're not you know and so yes we are going to lose we're going to lose places if we only focus on what we're losing you do despair but I look at that and I think there is a community out there that is so diverse they understand the cultures they understand the politics and so that's where that's where I find my belief that you know we've got somebody to hand this job off to you know they're going to keep working at it but they're there. So I, I, you know, if we just look at what we lose, we will despair. But I, I'm actually really hopeful. So let, me, let me give you yet another way of looking at it, <clears throat> uh, which sort of uh, springs off of what uh, Mike was talking about. Uh, on Earth Day this year, I went over to Annapolis to give two talks to a, a school where two of my granddaughters attend. So for the young ones, uh, you know, like second grade and younger, I talked about rainforests and what it's like to work in there. And you know, I got all kinds of little questions, including one little boy who wanted to know the difference between girl monkeys and boy monkeys. <laughs> and he knew the answer. He just wanted me to say it. <laughs> so the fourth time he asked me, I just said, it's just like people. <laughs> uh, then, then to the upper. Uh, school students, uh, I gave an unvarnished, undiluted talk about climate change and what it means for nature. Uh, and you hear people say, well, you can't tell them how bad it is because they'll be overwhelmed. Uh, to the contrary, every single one of them actually said they planned to do something about it. So uh, young people can help a lot especially when they talk to their parents. <laughs> okay, Mona, you've been waiting very patiently. Oh, sorry, okay, yeah, go ahead and then Mona, yeah, okay. sure. Elisa Van Susteren, um, I'm a physician, a psychiatrist, and on the board of the National Wildlife Federation. One of the things that I just wanted to comment on and share Peter's frustration sometimes with how do we get to the solutions side of things is that I do know that as a psychiatrist for now more than 20 years, working together uh, to do good 
is one of the things that makes life worth living. And in one, some ways, that is uh, an opportunity that this generation has that few have had to have such a purposeful life. And it brings me to the comment that uh, Marshall Gans at the Harvard School uh, at Harvard at the Kennedy School of Government is a great grassroots organizer and if there's one thing politicians will listen to it's uh, uh, an enlightened citizenry that's in the in the streets so that might be one thing in addition to disseminating all the knowledge is the gas the grassroots uh, interventions um, now I want to ask just a, a potentially really dumb question and try to redeem myself with one that's a little more intelligent um, the first is are, are zoos and aquariums all around the world doing everything everything that they can and can reasonably be expected to do to take care that their mission is transformed towards protecting species that are at risk. That's my first question. Then the second one is how much emphasis would you put on adaptation to things that we know are likely already uh, to happen to us? Gentlemen, before you answer that, because we're coming close, I want to get the, the couple of people who've been waiting. Mona and then lady in the back. Yeah, so if you could hand that first. Should we answer that one? Uh, uh, let's get the three and then give you a chance to answer those. So I've written them down to help you remember them. Okay. Yeah. My name is Nadia Saad. I'm retired from the World Bank where I ended up as an environment specialist. I have a quick comment to say that when I entered the bank in 1979, my boss called me to tell me that I have no future in the World Bank because I'm talking about environment and blue sky and all this pollution stuff. I have to stop the nonsense. And he said, we are serious people here and you have to learn to think like a man. Uh, so, and if you go on with this, you better go, if you, if you go on with this, you better go back to the United Nations. I was coming from UNEP. I was the regional director for UNEP for the Middle East, and I was, couldn't keep not talking about it. And he said, then you w should choose to go back to the United Nations. We are serious. And so I'm saying this to tell you that everybody's talking about environment in the World Bank. So, uh, well. Uh, some, anyway, but it's better than when I, it's much better than when I got in. There was, we were three fighting our career to stay in the World Bank. We were only three people in the whole World Bank who were talking about it. And my question is that if I remember well, the notion of biodiversity, the concept itself, was started by an Arab who said that every human being, if we are so different, it's because of the air, the different air we breathe, the different land that produce the food that we eat. So, uh, and I remember well the very first uh, study that came out of UNE uh, of, from UNESCO, I think it was in the late 60s or the early 70s, the concept itself of biodiversity included human uh, diversity, included cultural diversity. And I don't hear anything about this now. Now, my question for you, you I hope you should know, is it uh, thinkable that really we need the gene diversity that we have, that there may come a time where uh, some bug would attack some kind of race of some country where, where by, by inoculating different, you know, from different races we could so save a part of human... How, how is the concept of human and cultural and gene diversity comes into this general outlook on the necessity for survival of biodiversity. Okay. And then I think uh, just next to Sean, yeah. I'll do this very quickly. My name is Sheila McDonald. I'm with the Population Strategies Group. I've been a lobbyist, and it's really not a bad word, here in the Washington area for uh, about 40 years. And this woman is asking how you can get grassroots systems going. I, um, I've been trying to work on that with demographers and people in the population side of things. Very quickly, Dr. Shivian. Um, why is the biodiversity declining? Is it not human population like Ehrlich's book, the dominant animal that's causing it? Second of all, you're 
talking about saving biodiversity for health reasons, and I think that's wonderful and everybody in this room agrees with that, but isn't one of our problems is that we're too healthy, too many babies, people staying alive long, and we're the ones that are crushing the biodiversity. And finally, I want to ask, is your group, the scientists on nuclear war, and plus this group that's written the book, talking about human population growth? Thank you. Okay, so we had the zoos, adaptation, human and cultural diversity, and population, role of population. The full amend agenda for three and a half minutes. Thank, thank you all very much for your questions. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Why don't I deal with two of them? Okay. Uh, all the major zoos of the world uh, have become focused on conservation. Uh, whether they could do more is another question. Uh, but, you know, they have field programs and they do a lot of conservation action. Uh, they are also major uh, magnets to human population who come there and learn about the issues. So you can go to the zoo in the Bronx and, you know, learn about Madagascar or whatever. I mean, it, you know, and your ticket actually gives you the choice of what part of the revenue will go to what conservation project in the world. Um, on, on human diversity and health, uh, the answer is absolutely yes, uh, because the sickle cell gene, uh, which occurs naturally only in uh, Africans and people of African descent, uh, confers resistance against malaria. Uh, so I know there are people looking at how to use that uh, to, uh, to deal with the malaria problem. So, so that's two of them. Um, I'll, I'll uh, respond to uh, the ones I can. Um, the, the, the gene diversity is important in people, as Tom just illustrated with sickle cell, uh, but it's important throughout the, the living world. Uh, the more genetic diversity you have, the more, quote, resilience you have in an ecosystem. So. Uh, many studies, for example, with corals. If you have different species of corals and you have a bleaching event, some corals are more vulnerable to the bleaching than others, and the likelihood of that coral ecosystem uh, withstanding or perhaps recovering from that bleaching event is greater, the greater the genetic diversity you have of the corals in that system. Uh, uh, some really interesting work with beehives, when you have uh, of uh, a, a varied diversity of, of, of genes in a population in a single beehive. You'd expect it all to be the same genes, but it's not necessarily. They have, uh, the studies that have been done uh, are about the triggers that start the fanning behavior to keep the temperature within the hive at a constant uh, level for, to, for the queen. Um, and the greater diversity you have, the more resilience you have of that hive as the temperatures outside are fluctuating, you have a greater number of, uh, of uh, patterns of fanning behavior uh, from that. So, so it's not just in people. You've also mentioned cultural diversity, and one of the big issues that you know, Tom and others know a great deal about is one of the big concerns in places like the Amazon is that we're, we're not only losing biodiversity of the wildlife uh, and plants, et cetera, that live there, but even at a greater rate, we're losing the cultural diversity of the native tribes uh, that live there and their languages and their uh, verbal uh, histories. And uh, that's of great, great concern to, uh, including medical concern. Uh, because the oral tradition of, of the uh, native healers uh, is also being lost, uh, very valuable knowledge. The, the question about is biodiversity declining and is it human caused? Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, there, there are natural rates of extinction and, and a lot of work of calculating what the current levels of extinction are for various groups of organisms, and there are multiple times, so orders of magnitude, 10, 100,000, 
maybe in some cases even approaching 10,000 times natural background level. So are we at fault? Absolutely. Uh, are our numbers greater than uh, will uh, can be sustainable on this planet? Absolutely. Um, but I, I do believe that uh, uh, that it is possible for our large numbers uh, if we end up uh, being much smarter about uh, controlling them. Uh, bad word, controlling. But um, we can live much, much more sustainably on the planet than we do now in all kinds of ways. Uh, it's not necessarily the numbers in the United States that are causing the devastation uh, that exists. It's the way we live, the enormous waste the uh, Id idiocy of uh, some of our food systems, um, the you know the amount of food that's thrown out from restaurants and homes in the United States every day, the mega houses that are uh, burning uh, fossil fuels, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to put a plug in for uh, well-informed, scientifically based uh, policy with a new administration uh, that uh, uh, we believe really understands these issues. It's not going to be easy to tackle, particularly at the same time that there's an economic crisis. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that, uh, that with the present human population, we can do a much, much better job in protecting the natural world. I'll just throw one quick comment in, if, if this question of citizen organization, uh, probably the person who is the most impassioned on this is someone who we've all known for many years, Gus Speth, who is, you know, the head of WRI and created that, worked at, in U.S. government, worked at UNDP, was the dean at Yale, and he has become uh, absolutely uh, impassioned on this subject, that we have to get political, and that one of the weaknesses of the environmental movement in the United States is we have been scientific, but we've not been political. You know, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. He comes out of the much more let's work with the system school of the environmental movement. So I'm going to be fascinated to see what he does with this next stage in a very distinguished career and uh, to try to capture that. So it'll, I don't know if that's the, the answer, but there clearly is some people who feel that that may be somewhere where we've been a little too timid. Well, we've, we've reached the point in time, obviously, um, very rich presentation, some excellent questions, and um, we look forward to you all rushing right out and getting yourself a copy of the book uh, and sharing it with others. I have a couple uh, family birthdays coming up that I now have solved that problem <laughs> of what to get. Um, please uh, share the fact that this uh, presentation and the write-up uh, about this discussion uh, will be on our website, and there certainly are many of the places here easily you can find uh, this book and the discussions of it. But please go, uh, uh, be sure to share this uh, with, with others, and join me in thanking our panelists for an excellent discussion today. <laughs>